Uh, if you have questions, type those in to Sally and she'll be uh, monitoring all that for us. I want to kind of kick things off a little bit by asking everybody out there a question, uh, a little bit of a rhetorical question since I can't hear your responses. But I think about this in terms of what do you see uh, when you look at a flower? Of the flowers, I mean, I, I was thinking about this in my drive into work this morning and stuff. It's such a huge part of our culture. Uh, just driving down the road, you know, the, the color is the first thing that attracts me is that splash of color. I'm looking at this beautiful sky blue chicory that's uh, blooming on the side of the road. Uh, what is it that attracts us about? I mean, we just seem to be inherently drawn to this. Is it the color, the shape of it, uh, the fragrance that pulls us into it? I mean, we, we have this connection with flowers where we take flowers and use them to celebrate special days, you know, whether it's a birth or a death or, a, you know, anything in between, you know, we show our love to each other. It's even thinking of little children pick flowers to give to their teachers and their mom. Uh, you know, there's whole industries built around this, you know, floral industries, you know, the florist shop, you know, the industry that I'm in, landscaping, gardening. It's just this kind of deep inherent connection that's there. And I, I'm trying to think what is the beauty uh, that pulls that into us. So take a look at flowers, you know, look closely at them, uh, not just, oh, isn't that pretty, you know, what is it about that flower that really draws us into it? Well, what I was thinking about was I'm going to talk a little bit about not what you and I see in the flower, but why the plants produce the flower. Why do flowers exist? Um, what do other organisms see? Kind of what do they play in terms of their ecological benefit that goes with that? So today, like I said, we're going to look at flowers. We're going to talk about pollination. Um, and what I'm really trying to do is just inspire you a little bit when you're out enjoying your garden and maybe take a little different view of it. So with that, I'm just, I've got pictures again to kind of help uh, lead us along through this conversation. So I sort of let what, what started me down this road when I'm sitting around thinking about, oh, what do I want to talk about today? Uh, I happen to be standing out in the shrub section and there's this bush honeysuckle. It's a beautiful sunny day, you know, blue skies, it's out there. I just look down and there's this bumblebee that is just, look at this. I mean, this guy, he's just rolling around, bathed in pollen. Uh, I, I just, this, this bee just, it just seemed to be just having the time of its life down there going from flower to flower, you know, seeking after the nectar, you know, collecting the pollen and just watching this whole thing take place in front of me uh, really expresses what the basic biology of the whole thing is, right? So the plants, the flowering plants, uh, their goal is all about reproduction. Uh, for the plant's perspective, they need to find a mate. They need to find a partner basically to have sex with and produce offspring. Uh, so this is a talk about plant sex. Uh, but with plants, they don't get, they can't, they're stationary, right? They're sedentary, they're stuck in their ground. They can't just meander across the field or something to, to partner up with something. They have to rely on some way to help them in between. So the whole idea here is to get the pollen, uh, which carries, you know, the, the male, part of the process forward they've got to get their pollen over to fertilize a um a female flower and since they're not able to just kind of walk over there and introduce themselves and do it they have to rely on other organisms to do this work for them so the flowers uh their their function the reason that they exist it's basically to attract pollinators over to them. And this can be, as we'll look at, this can be insects, it can be birds, it can be animals. Um, but their whole goal is I need to attract uh, some other organism over here to collect my pollen and disperse it over to another flower uh, so fertilization can take place and I can produce some offspring. So those flowers are not there necessarily to, uh, for our enjoyment, it's not necessarily some altruistic relationship of, you know, exchange with the 
birds and the bees and stuff, their goal is how can I produce more seeds? Now, in this case, they're um, utilizing insects, they're utilizing uh, the bumblebee to be their go-between in this process, uh, kind of the matchmaker, I might say. So the bee, by turn, it's just going over there because its goal is it wants nectar that's high in sugar to provide energy. It wants pollen that's high in protein to use as a food source for itself and its young. So this is not a love affair kind of thing. Um, this is just a mutual exchange that takes place uh, between organisms. And it's just thrilling to actually be able to watch this when it happens. Still, I, I take so much pride. I happen to be just the right place at the right time with this picture. Again, you can see the bumblebee is visiting, in this case, guara, uh, which I, I'm gonna back up quickly. Again, this is bush honeysuckle, which is uh, a plant that's native to the um, to Virginia, but more in the western part of the states and southern parts of the states. So it's not a Fairfax native, but it's a native shrub that can get about four to six feet wide, kind of flowering now. Again, guara, a nice native wildflower that grows throughout here. In this case, again, bumblebees, one of the best pollinators out there, again, native bee. Uh, so you can see how they're covered with this fur. This fur, the plant utilizes this because as they come to visit the flower, uh, and again, the whole idea we call advertise and reward, the plant's advertising, it's producing this very colorful, very attractive display to kind of signal, hey, I'm here, over here, over here, trying to invite the bees to come into it. They will have nectar in there as a reward for the bee. If they come over here, you get a sip of nectar, and then the bee in the process of collecting that nectar as a food source also transfers the pollen. Here, the, the bumblebee is forming what we call a pollen basket where they're actually collecting that pollen to take back and they'll use as sustenance for their young. So again, it's this mutual exchange that takes place and we're just the bystanders on there. But when I'm watching all this happen, you think about, well, how, how does this come about? Where does it begin? Well, going back like 350 million years ago, it really was a green world. Uh, we didn't have flowers 350 million years ago. They were primarily ferns, mosses, plants that produced by spores, the uh, gymnosperms, things like pines. And what, the, what happened there, it was a more aquatic environment. And so this fertilization took place outside of the plant. These plants produce spores. They depend a little bit on the wind to disperse it. They carry into the, into the water. And then fertilization would actually take place in more of an aquatic environment. Um, we still see this go on today. It's an old, tried, and proven way of reproduction. Uh, pine trees, again, what they were doing is they were relying on wind for dispersal. When pines bloom, as you can see, the pollen cones are that sort of that bright yellow. On a windy day, this will carry itself far and wide and disperse, and it falls on a little receptive cone that you see at the top of that plant. So this is a really successful, very effective model of reproduction, and it works for hundreds of millions of years. This story progresses, and we go back about, let's say, about 120 million years ago. That's when we start to see our first flowering plants, our first angiosperms. And so I'm using this magnolia here, the southern magnolia is a good example, is one of the ancient flowering plants. Because if you look at this and you lose a little bit of your imagination, think of this almost, you can almost visualize a pine cone shape. And this environment, you suddenly have a flowering plant, but what it's done is it's advertising, right? Beautiful fragrance that they put out. Big white flowers, again, saying, here I am, come and get it, advertising the rewards to whoever comes here to come gather the nectar. Uh, and the idea is this big open flower, this is probably pollinated by beetles because beetles were some of the first earliest insects, true insects. So big open flower like this, beetles could crawl up in there, they're bumbling around looking, they're getting something to eat and in the process, they go on to distribute the pollen which then leads to fertilization and the production of the seed that goes on from there. Uh, over time, over you know, literally like 
tens of millions of years, if not hundreds of millions of years, this whole process continues to evolve. Uh, so one of the plants that I go into that I think is really interesting is our native pawpaw. Uh, the pawpaw, you see, again, when it flowers, uh, if you ever notice this, it actually has kind of a, a stinky smell to it. Because you look at it and say, okay, now here's a flower that's kind of this brown or maroon color. It hangs upside down under the foliage. So it's not doing a really good job of advertising itself. It's pretty hidden. It's a dull color to it and it stinks and it kind of smells um, like rotting fruit is quite honestly what it smells like. Or more specifically, it smells like yeast. Uh, so what the ecologists and everything have found is this is an example of a plant that formed a relationship with flies. It intentionally, it's developed, it found its strategy of, hey, if I can kind of look and smell like a piece of rotting fruit, that then I can capture flies to come to my service. And the flies go after there thinking they're in for a piece of rotten fruit. And what they do is again, they stumble around collecting the pollen and transfer it in the process. And of course, that leads to these beautiful um, pawpaws that, that we can then eat and enjoy. So I think it's just really cool how you see this um, development of uh, where it becomes more and more specific, where the plants continue to modify themselves and they adapt, just trying to find what works for them in terms of this advertise and reward kind of relationship. Uh, this is what goes on and brings us this beautiful, beautiful collection of flowers that we all get to enjoy, that we all put in our gardens. Uh, this is a Tartarian aster that blooms in late summer. Uh, you're probably not going to see this flowering until really August, September, uh, maybe even early October time period. Uh, but here, the aster family, this is what they call composite flower. One of the ways it has successfully adapted is if you look inside the head form of this flower right here, this is actually a cluster of many little flowers together. Uh, this is not an individual. This is again why we call it a composite flower. The outer, the outer ring of flowers develop what we call ray flowers. That's where the petals form. And then in the center, what we refer to as disc flowers. And they open sequentially over a period of uh, a few weeks, a couple weeks. So what this means is that you can have bees, as you can see up here in this case, bees and wasps know that they can keep coming back to this flower time and time again, uh, because they will be there. There'll be new flowers continue to open over a succession of time. So they'll be there where they can continue to get reward over a period of time. And the fact that they've kind of clustered themselves together, they make for a better display and a little place where they can, the bees and pollinators, they can kind of hang out. They can sit down there and take a rest and work their way through the flowers. So when you're out there seeing this in your garden, all this is going on right in front of our own eyes. And it's just, it's just amazing to be able to watch and behold it. Uh, and then, so we talked anywhere, you know, we talked about beetles pollinating, we talked about flies pollinating, bees pollinating, and then of course there's butterflies. This starts getting every, you know, everybody's imagination because again, they're just, they're just beautiful and you know, who can't absolutely love seeing butterflies in the garden. So in this case, uh, we're looking at uh, Budlia, the butterfly bush. Its flower is more tube shaped, right? Uh, because if you're thinking about a bee, again, we go back to this as a little open blossom here, bees tend to have a very short tongue that they can reach in and, and gather the nectar. So in this case, the, um, the flower has developed a longer tube to it. So a bee really has a difficult time. They can't reach deep enough in that tube to access the nectar. Um, but what they can do is they can enlist the help of uh, butterflies and moths. Because again, the butterfly and the moth they have this long proboscis. It curls up under their chin, so to speak, and then they can roll it out. They can reach deeper into the blossoms. So plants become getting more and more specialized. Uh, they get, it enhances their chance of successful pollination because if I can specifically attract butterflies and then I have a better chance because knowing that butterfly is going to visit another flower, another plant at the same 
species and do the job of reproduction for me. So these relationships over these eons of time, they become more and more specialized uh, as we go into it. Still kind of following that same old risk and reward model. Um, now moths, there are actually more moths than there are butterflies, but we don't see them because they fly at nighttime. But this is a hawk moth or a clear wing moth that you can see there uh, that is active during the day. This is a good example. I see, I see that long proboscis. This is, it uses this specialized mouthpiece so it can reach deep into these tubular flowers to access the nectar that's there. Uh, so they, they develop these um, mutualistic relationships between both the plant and the animals uh, that they utilize to distribute uh, the pollen and make fertilization happen for them. Uh, hummingbirds, uh, you know, just can't say enough about that. I mean, what a, a, a amazing natural thing to just behold and sit and watch. So very similar in that we have this kind of tubular shaped flower that you see in the Crocosmia. Uh, the hummingbird is reaching in there to access the nectar, which they need because they're burning so many calories, they need the high sugar nectar that's in there. But in the process, right, you see up here um, are the reproductive parts of the flower. So up on the right here on these lower part of it, this is the anther where the pollen exists. This is the stigma up here, the female part that gets pollinated. So when the hummingbird is in there working these flowers to get the nectar, inevitably they get the pollen dusted on their forehead. They move over to visit the next crocosmian in the process. They're causing that uh, pollination and then subsequently the fertilization to happen. So yeah, I know this is all like a biology class, but one of the things I get to do when these Zoom classes is share the stuff that I like to put out there. Oh, so all this goes through my mind when we're out there looking at flowers, but nature is always, always, always adapting here. So if you look at this, this is a uh, Nicotiana or flowering tobacco. Uh, this one, the Sylvestris, it, it flowers at night it's got a very um, pungent kind of fragrance and you can see this long tubular flower that's in there. This is clearly designed for some of these sphinx moths that have that long proboscis that fly at night. So it's white in its color, it's fragrant. It's there obviously uh, for the nightlife. But what can happen, you see what's going right here, this bee, this is what we call robbing. Well, the bees, they can't reach down through that big tube to get the nectar, but they know it's there. And I don't think you can really see it in this image, but I you know if you start looking in here, you'll see these little cuts, these little incisions where the bumblebee has actually gone in, used its mandibles, cut an opening into the flower and goes in and it's now taking the nectar. It's getting the reward, but it's not providing the service of pollination. So again, they, they, you know, it's, it's a cutthroat world out there, everybody trying to get their piece of the pie. But not this, you know, this gets really displayed really well in the orchid family. Orchids are probably some of our most, um, most recent uh, families of plants, and they tend to have developed the most specialized relationships uh, between not just the pollinators, but also the environment in which they grow highly specialized plants. Uh, so this is a pink lady slipper. It's a, you know, one of our native orchids that if you're very, very lucky uh, to find growing in the woods around here, they develop these very elaborate specialized um, flowers. And again, it's not, you know, to provide interest to you and me, it's, um, this is all about reproduction. Again, it's the same sort of advertise and reward idea. So the pollinators, in this case, small bees, know that there's uh, nectar in there because they, they'll even put on the nice fragrance. So everything is here to attract them into it. Uh, but you actually have to enter into this flower. They'll actually enter into the flower. And then once they get caught up inside here, the, the orchid essentially traps them in there. And the other thing is really, once the bee gets in there, they discover there is no nectar for them. 
Uh, it takes a lot of energy for the plants to produce pollen and nectar. So the orchid says, hey, I'm not giving this up easy. Why waste my time and effort and spend the resources on producing pollen and nectar for the bees? What's in it for me? Well, within this little maze, there's really one way in, one way out. And as the bees find their way out, they pick up their pollen is here what we call plinia, exists in a little saddlebag. Now these are two different orchids. Um, clearly this is a Phalaenopsis orchid that I found this bumblebee um, in the greenhouse on. So it just gave me an opportunity to get a picture versus the uh, lady slipper that's out in the wild. wild. But what's happened here, this, um, the, the orchids, their pollen is in this, like I said, it's kind of patched together in this little saddlebag so as the bee is finding their way around and they start to exit out, it inevitably sticks to their leg or onto their antennae or their back or something. And then they serve the job of transport where they're moving at pollen back and forth. Um, but in this case, the bee gets no reward. So I thought, hey, the first one I show the bee that's robbing the nectar and the second one I see the flower that's tricking the bee. So these games, these, this takes place and goes on and on between this interaction that goes on out there. Uh, so I'm going to just take a, a minute or two here and then we'll start taking questions in there and I'll, and I'll stop talking and let you take the floor after that. But um, because butterflies uh, you know, capture everybody's attention, again, just a quick refresher. One of the things that we love so much about the butterflies is this metamorphosis. They're, they're a good example we call complete metamorphosis where they start out as an egg, the egg hatches into a larval form that, and here I've got pictures of a cercopia moth uh, feeding on a willow plant. Uh, the cercopia, again, this is the larval stage. It's, this is that point where they're building up fat and protein and they're, they're just eating machines is really all their goal is, is just to consume and eat as much as they can. Uh, and so, and of course, they eat plants. After they have reached maturity, uh, they, they've had a chance to bulk up, they go into their pupa. So we go from an egg to a larvae. The pupa is where this big next transformation occurs, and then they emerge out in their adult form. Uh, so to see this kind of transformation go forward is just, you know, I don't care how young or how old you are, you just got to be amazed with it and attract it in there. Of. Uh, so again, the way this works, you know, is emphasizing that, that you have that life cycle that's there. All of this depends on the plants. So the flowers are out there and they're providing the pollen and nectar for the adults, but you also have to have plants that provide food for the larvae. So again, if you want black swallowtail, then you're going to have what we call the parsley worm. Parsley worm is the larval stage of the swallowtail. It eats primarily plants that are in the carrot family. So this is things like in this picture, this is on fennel, but they'll eat fennel, they'll eat dill, they'll eat parsley, um, really anything in that family, you know, Queen Anne's lace. But these relationships, because they developed over so much time, they become more and more and more specialized, right? Um, in this case, um, of course, the caterpillar uh, is, is out there. Uh, I have one more, I forgot this, ad, this guy in here again, just to entice you again. This is a, the fritillary, which can, can go to many different food sources. Here you see it feeding out of the um, zinnia, which could be a bee, could be feeding from the zinnia, butterflies are. But the larvae really feeds primarily in the, the um, violet family. So if we're going to have these butterflies, again, that means that we're going to have caterpillars and we're going to have plants to feed on them. Uh, now, likewise, the caterpillar becomes a food source. It's a primary and critical food source for birds. Uh, and this is really, I think, the work you've heard me refer many times, uh, Dr. Doug Tallamy from um, up in Delaware. He's the guy that really, really started connecting the dots for us, a lot of us that's in there. What he's showing that when a, when a birds, when they are in their birthing stage, if they're going to be laying eggs, they need high amounts of protein. Uh, yes, they can supplement their diets and they can eat berries and they can eat seeds, but it's the protein 
uh, that comes primarily from caterpillars that they're going to need to feed their young so that their young can develop through fledging stage and, and, and reach maturity. He went out and he identified, he studied many, many different plants trying to show which ones supported, supported the most number of caterpillars. And you can see the chart here. So these become some of the most valuable plants in our landscape. Uh, and where this whole story is going is basically saying, hey, if you want to have a, a functional ecosystem um, where we can have the insects that support the wildlife and the wildlife, you know, that then you follow the food chain off supports larger predators, ultimately supports us and supports just a functioning healthy ecosystem. Yeah, got to have the right plants. And because many of these caterpillars have very specialized relationships, they don't have alternatives. If you, a pipevine swallowtail larvae needs pipevine to eat. It can't change food sources. That's what it what needs. If you want spice bush, spice bush swallowtail, you need to have spice bush in your landscape. They don't have alternative food sources. So the real idea is, here is that we want to incorporate as many different plants, diverse plants we have, so that we can have a consistent food source. And wherever we can, we want to incorporate native plants that can actually support the native insects and wildlife that live here with us. Because it's uh, known to everybody, um, habitats being lost. Now, if we had this type of habitat where we've got the native plants, um, where we have the habitat of a, a large canopy of trees, the understory, we've got water sources. When we have everything together here, it all functions well as a functioning, healthy, effective ecosystem. But with development going on, more housing, more roads, more building, the loss of habitat that takes place, our impact on, it just becomes more and more and more critical uh, for us as gardeners to do that. So again, you know um, this by now, I am not Personally, I'm not like a native only enthusiast. I'm just a plant enthusiast, a garden enthusiast. I think we need to just, just kind of, I'm saying just do it, just mix as many different plants as we can. So we've got both pollen for the adults, um, the, the nectar for the adults. So we've got canopy coverage. So we've got food sources for the larvae, just put it all together. And again, we're, if you have questions, you can um, start saying them now, because this really, all I want to do is get that message out there. And ultimately, this has like been a whole big learning experience that I'm on. When I started gardening back as a teenager, I was just out there looking, saying, oh, pretty flowers. But as you study the flowers, you become aware of the insects, you get aware of the insects, you get a bigger view of the ecology, the life it supports. And most of all, just go out there and enjoy that I'm going to just stop talking for a minute, take a sip of water and turn it back to Sally. Thanks, David. All right. If you all have questions, uh, we've got about 15 minutes to answer them. So uh, please feel free to write those in. Um, we do have some questions coming in. So to start out with David, um, we had a question is the Tartarian Aster. I know, I think we have native varieties of Aster. Is that, a, is that a native variety or is that not native? The one that you showed earlier. I don't know. I, I should know that, but um, I, think that that is a native one. Uh, and again, when I say native, I don't know if it's necessarily a Northern Virginia native. I believe it is a Virginia native, but double check me on that. Uh, again, we don't, we don't have them in stock and I'm not even sure if we will, because that's a, that's a late summer bloomer. Um, and a lot again, this is commercial side of it. People tend to buy plants when they're in bloom. Um, so that's something we'd hit later this summer, uh, but we can look into that or, or there's many good resources you can look into that yourself. Thanks, yeah, we had a question about that and I wasn't sure if it was native or not, so I thought I would ask. Um, we've had a couple questions come in about for people with shady gardens. Is there any way that people who have a lot of shade are there plants that are shade loving that support pollinators as well or is that a more difficult um situation to deal with well it's it's a it's kind of a little bit of a yes and no there are many plants that you can have in the shade garden to support um natives thing is most of those flower in the very early spring so i didn't work them into like my presentation today because if you think about um our natural environment our ecology here is a hardwood forest so 
in February, March, April, May, sunlight is still making its way through the tree canopy and it's getting down to the forest floor. So this is where our spring ephemerals, everything from bloodroot and trout lily and Virginia bluebells and anemone and spring beauty. And I mean, there's tons of things, Dutchman's breeches, uh, tons of things, but they are primarily the early spring bloomers because our tree canopy, it's full density in June. So right now, today, tree canopies at full density, there's very little sunlight reaching the, the forest floor. So there's not a whole lot that's blooming right now at this time of year that's in there. So, so the answer is yes, but you're looking primarily at spring wildflowers. Um, and again, some, a lot of the larval food that I was talking about is good understory plantings, also things like a spice bush. Uh, you know, it's, it's a shrub, small tree shrub, but that's definitely like an understory uh, planting. So, so kind of a yes and no answer. Not a whole lot going on right now today, but if we had this a month or two ago, it would have been a big yes. Different times of year. All right, that makes sense. Um, next question is actually when I was thinking about myself during your presentation. Um, this person asked if the Asclepius tuberosa, she wanted to know what types of butterflies feed on that because hers are currently stalks. Um, Good. I, I, yeah, that's what I was going to say. I think that's the monarchs. Is that correct? Yeah. And I, um, yeah, here it is. Right. So those, this is the Sclepius tuberosa. Um, and it fits so well into our conversation and a must have for butterfly gardens because this is the exclusive food source for monarch butterflies. Right. Um, monarchs can only feed on milkweed. It doesn't have to be this milkweed, it could be the swamp milkweed, the common milkweed, this one they call butterfly weed. Um, but again, the, the larvae, the caterpillar, it, it can't, it has no plan B. It feeds on milkweed. So when you say you have nothing but stalks, I'm saying that's great because the reason you planted it was for caterpillar food. So the caterpillars feed on this as a larval food. Um, this one I brought because it's starting to bloom as it flowers. Now, many pollinators will come to the blooms, everything from bumblebees and, and wasps and honeybees and butterflies. Many different pollinators come to the flower for the because there's copious amount of nectar that's in there. But it is there feeding the larvae. And it sounds like you probably have somebody visiting you because here's another thing that the milkweed is toxic. Um, it gets its name because when you cut it, it exudes this white milky sap. But the, the monarch butterfly and one or two other insects like milkweed beetle have adapted to where they can eat this. They ingest what's toxic to other insects, but they accumulate that um, compound in their skin so that that becomes a natural defense from them. So the birds won't eat them because they take the toxin from the plant and incorporate in their skin. So it's just the more you dig into this, the more fascinating it gets. But yeah, any any of the milkweeds um, will serve. And instead of thinking bugs are bad, we got to change our thinking and say this is a big success if your um, milkweed's been devoured. It'll grow back, um, and that's why you planted it. Thanks, David. Yeah, I was thinking about that, too, because my grandmother planted it a couple of years ago, and it was all gone so, so fast. So I was like, actually, that's a good one to ask David, because I was curious. We are like stock to the gills of milkweed right now. Yeah. This is my <laughs> business pitch there. Come on in, and we'll fix you up with some milkweed. Support the monarchs. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right, here's a question. So someone was looking at bush honeysuckle the other day, um, and they've done some research. They've seen that there are some invasive honeysuckles, and then there's a native honeysuckle. So can you address... The honeysuckle and selecting the correct variety and if there's one that's better yeah absolutely the um so the ones that i was showing you and and i don't think it'll show i brought in behind me here this guy and this guy these are native bush honeysuckles now again they're they're native to sort of the southeastern part of the united states not where we're standing here because it's not a 100 percent locally native if you go two counties, what three counties west of here becomes a native plant. And so they'll grow naturally all down, you know, through the um, mountains, all the way down through Tennessee and everything. 
Um, now, in all fairness, these have been selected and somewhat even hybridized to get the little more colorful leaf, a little more dramatic coloration that goes in. These are not considered, these are not invasive plants. Invasive plants are like the Japanese honeysuckle, the Tartarian honeysuckle, the Amur honeysuckle. These are Asian species that we people brought over here to the to the United States to plant in our gardens. Hey, because they're pretty. They have nice flowers on it. The flowers produce pretty berries. They're lovely in our garden, but then the birds eat the berries and then they start dominating the landscape and out competing our other ones. So those are invasive plants um, that, you know, that we don't want to get after. These guys are, are the good ones, but you absolutely need to be aware of that and make good choices. Thanks, uh, David. For the vining, there are native um, trumpet honeysuckles. So that, again, there's there's good ones and then there's problem ones. Definitely, yeah. Um, always something good, I think, to talk to plant specialists about if you're confused when you come into the store, if you want more information. Um, all right, so we have two questions that go together. Uh, the first is, how do you deal with pests that are killing the plants without injuring the pollinators. Um, and then a reminder from one of our viewers that ants can pollinate too. So. Yes, absolutely. You know, and we just can't go through the whole thing. I mean, ants pollinate. Um, I just reading the other day, I didn't realize, but there's even certain lizards that will pollinate. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's not exclusive territory to bees by any, any stretch of the imagination. Um, Pest management becomes an issue of, and there I can tell you it's, um, again, we want to identify the pest accurately, look at different um, options are available. Uh, I'm going to just share again that my little milkweed story kind of anecdotal thing. So I had, um, I was growing swamp milkweed in my garden and I grow the, um, the butterfly weed. So now there is also what's called a, an oleander aphid. Um, this is an aphid that you'll recognize it's a bright orange color, really stands out. And they get on milkweed like nobody's business. So here I am, I've got my milkweed that's out here from my, hopefully from my monarch butterflies. And I mean, this thing is like covered from top to bottom with these aphids. And I'm hoping that we'll get natural predators because again, aphids have a lot of parasitic wasps and ladybugs and everything else comes in to eat them. But guess what? this particular aphid has no predators. It itself is toxic. So even when the ladybugs won't eat it, so it has no predators, it's just devouring. I mean, it's, it's making my milkweed look like just a big blob of sooty mold and everything. Again, learning process, so I'll look into it. So in that case, um, what I ended up using was a horticultural oil spray. The oil, it's a, it's a natural product, it's a highly refined oil. You spray it on there, it kills the aphids you know, on contact, closes up the breathing pores. Um, there is no residual carryover to other insects. So, so you'll have to kind of play a little bit of a balancing act sometimes on these things. And again, I just I really invite you to come in and talk to us at the plant clinic. Um, give us a picture of what you're trying to do. There, there are some natural alternatives, there's cultural methods. Um, there are ways that we can manage some of these pests, but it's sometimes a complicated situation. Definitely, yeah. It sounds like another thing to maybe consult with your specific circumstances with on our plant clinic. Um, yeah, but soap and oils are a lot of times, that's the route I try to go because they're gonna have probably the least impact and the, and the shortest residual if they can get the job done. Sounds good. Um, all right, next question is, how do you keep deer from eating your pollinator plants? Wow, that is a whole big thing. Um, Any quick tips or maybe something for another day or more in-depth discussion? Well, it's, it's just, you know, it's the same old thing. I think we've had classes, you know, it's like fencing, you know, exclusion, like with fencing, you know, most of the time we're dealing with repellents. Uh, we have a couple really good repellents, things, one that's called Bob X, one that's called Liquid Fence are our two most effective ones. These repellents are non-toxic. They just smell bad. The um, deer have horrible vision, but they've got really powerful sense of smell. So you can put things in your garden that basically the smell will deter and keep them away from it. But it's one more thing that you got to keep up with. It's just when I was like, my head was spinning. It's like, 
Next to humans, deer are, I think, the number two um, organism most responsible for loss of biodiversity. But that's a whole other thing. And again, it's, um, but yeah, the simple answer is, yeah, repellents, you know, if you can do fencing, fencing is great. All right. Thanks, David. Um, next question is, um, can you suggest some pollinators that grow well in containers, particularly for honeybees? Oh, everything here uh, grows well in containers. Um, you know, I, for honeybees, try and see what I brought around, because I was thinking, see, this is my hummingbird plant. Um, but anything that has sort of a daisy type flower to it, you know, like we were looking at zinnias, that composite flower that forms a head or a cluster of small short flowers is designed for bees. So, I mean, this goes into Rudbeckia, you know, your black eyed Susans, um, cone flowers, zinnias, uh, gazanias, uh, you know, many, many things. Those are, again, those are pretty much sun plants. Thanks, David. Um, all right, let's see. Next question is, is um, Dervilla bush a honey, is that a honeysuckle, the one that yes. you showed in the beginning? Yes, okay, yes. okay. Uh, great. Um, okay, guys, we have time for a couple more. So just want to let you know, if you don't get your question answered, please feel free to follow up with me after the class. You can send me an email if you're listening to this on Facebook Live. Um, visit our website and fill out the Contact Us tab. That's the fastest way to get in touch with us. Um, that goes to our education team as well. We get those emails so we can help send it to the right person to answer your question, David, or another member of our team. Um, Here's a question for lantana, which I know is a really popular plant. Um, this person's lantana hasn't bloomed very well. She has a yellow lantana. Um, do you know if lantana has any common issues that people experience or should she maybe bring some pictures in to the plant clinic? Well, again, lantana um, needs lots of sunshine. Um, it does respond well to fertilizer also, um, and it likes warm conditions. Um, and I would just, been saying in my own garden, it's been a little slow to take off. I thought I was going to get ahead of the game and planted it even in late April. But then, of course, um, May was kind of a cold month. Uh, things have kind of obviously warmed up now, you know, in the 90s. So the big thing is, you know, lots of sunshine. Once it's established, it's pretty drought tolerant, but, you know, keep it watered as needed. Um, but I don't know if you're fertilizing, but step up your fertilizer game a little bit. Uh, might just be with an all purpose or something, but a water soluble fertilizer, you know, that you mix in the water, like, you know, the Jack's Classic, um, you know, so that it gets to it quickly. Uh, that, that will usually get them moving pretty good. Thanks, David. All right, time for one more really quickly. Um, is there a better time of the year to spray for pests if you're needing to spray the horticultural oil? Uh, I'm gonna say, better time of day. So, so with oil, first of all, um, it needs to be, it should be above 50 degrees and below 90 degrees, you know, and no rain. It, you know, so during the application time, during the drying time, um, moderate temperatures and dry conditions. Uh, but in general, I was going to say also your, your pollinators are most active um, during daylight hours. Because uh, again, as the day is warm, they warm up and they're more active that's in there. So if you're doing your spraying, I try to get it early in the morning or late in the evening um, for a couple of reasons. One, there's less activity from the pollinators, so you avoid risk of contact there. And also you're looking for cooler temperatures and dry conditions so that the product doesn't wash off. Okay, perfect. Um, all right, it is 2.46. Uh, so it's about time for us to close. Just a couple of quick notes before uh, David closes out. Um, we had a, a person ask David how, uh, if people can schedule an appointment with you or get in touch. Um, so David, I'll let you address that, but I will say anybody who wants to follow up after class with a question, uh, reminder, if you're on Zoom, you can hit reply to your email, contact me. I will put you in touch with David by email. Um, I do not answer questions about pollinator plants or anything gardening related. Um, I answer questions about how to register for classes. So I'll put you in touch with someone who knows what they're talking about or David. Um, and uh, but, but I do want to just jump in on that. Yeah, yeah, please do. 
I'm generally speaking, I'm at the Fair Oaks location yeah, that's uh, Tuesday through Fridays. Um, my schedule's like eight to four thirty. Um, stop by and see me, please. Yeah. Um, on Saturdays, I work down at the uh, Falls Church store at Maryfield, usually there at like nine thirty to six. So I'm there at the in the store at the plant clinic most of the time. You know, you can always call ahead to make sure I'm there. Email, as you mentioned, is is really the best way to reach me because I do move around between stores and as any retail worker knows my hours are inconsistent um so i'm hard to reach on the phone but you know i'm here in person and uh you know email yeah definitely thank you david um yeah so if you all have any questions following class please email us um and david do you have anything you'd like to close off with before we uh finish the class up no, because I have not decided what I want to talk about uh, in that couple of weeks from now. If you got any ideas, suggestions, please um, send them along. Otherwise, I just talk about whatever I feel like talking about. Sounds good. Well, we'll see everybody in two weeks. And if you all have uh, any questions for us uh, or suggested topics, please feel free to send me an email. Uh, we do take those into account. And David, a lot of times goes off of what current situations are in the gardening world, uh, weather related or anything like that. So um, we also have a couple of other classes coming up. So feel free to go check out our website for some of our summer classes. Those take place on Tuesdays and Thursdays at noon. Um, and thank you all so much for joining us today. This concludes our virtual plant clinic. Thanks, David. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye.